Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Desmond Martin. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at Next Wave STEM, and it is my very good pleasure to have you in another one of our free webinar series. Today, we're going to be talking about getting started with drones in any learning scenario. Um, really, really interesting situation that we find ourselves in as many of us are moving to the summer, and we're thinking about what our students are going to be doing during the course of the summer programs or summer camps that they're participating with, but also we're looking forward to in-person, in-class time in the fall with our students, um, whether that's during school time or even out of school time. Um, we are so excited to consider drones as a way to really reach our students where they may be, get them excited about getting back into the classroom and really getting hands-on with emerging technologies in STEM. That being said, we want to make sure that we consider ways to flexibly approach this technology, especially for students who might have not have access to all the technology that they need. Um, there are lots of different ways for us to really get hands on and make some meaningful learning come from what we would do as we study and learn more about drones. I'm really excited to jump into that today. Before we go any further, though, there are just a few housekeeping notes that I do want to mention. Um, the first is that we are in webinar mode today. Uh, that means that, unfortunately, I won't be able to hear you and I won't be able to see your face. Um, however, uh, we will love your feedback and input. Um, the chat is open for everyone. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you'd like to add anything at all, um, feel free to jump into the chat. In that same vein, uh, the Q&A functionality is also open for our participants today. Uh, that means that if you have any questions that you want to have answered, we'll get a nice little pop-up on our end, and we will be able to answer your questions live on the air. But we are leaving a, uh, a section of time at the very end of our webinar today to also answer your questions. I'm seeing familiar faces on the line with us as well. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, the second bit of housekeeping that I would like to mention is for our Illinois educators. Um, today's webinar session is counting as an hour of professional development credit for the state of Illinois um, for ISBE. That means that everyone who is in attendance today will be getting an email follow-up from me that includes a recording of the webinar, the slide deck that we're using for the webinar today, but also a proof of attendance form. Make sure that you use that form and submit that for your PD credit hours. Um, unfortunately, uh, I'm already hearing some of us through the internet. <laughs> unfortunately, we don't have any PD partnerships in other states as of yet, but that's something that we have been working on and we're going to continue to work on to make sure we can get you the information that you need. With all of that being said, I'm so excited to jump right into it with all of you. And a great place to begin is right at the very beginning. So at the very top, I want to talk a little bit about who we are at Next Wave STEM. Um, more than anything, we believe that you, you as educators, you as administrators, are critical to helping our students learn about emerging technologies. You're critical because you are spending the most time with our students. And as instructors, you're giving them the opportunity to explore emerging technologies without fear of failure, just through the culture that you've established with your students this entire time that you've been working with them, whether that's in the context of the pandemic or a much more regular time. Um, we think that's important. Your role as an educator is important um, because we know that our society is facing some massive challenges. Um, things like climate change or food insecurity. Um, there are a host of other really, really, really big problems. And we also believe that next wave STEM, that science, technology, engineering, and mathematics are going to be critical to helping solve those problems. Uh, that's kind of why STEM is right in the name of our company. What we try to do at next wave STEM, what we envision ourselves as being is a company that will give you the tools that you need to teach STEM concepts in a hands-on, engaging way with your students with confidence and fidelity. Um, that means that we want to make sure that you have the tools that you need to really make things happen with your students. How do we go about that? 
Well, at Next Wave STEM, what we are currently offering are 12 K through two or K through 12 courses, I should say, um, K through 12 courses on emerging technologies, things like robotics, drones, 3D printing, and artificial intelligence that allow your students, um, especially those students who have never worked with those technologies before, the opportunity to get hands on and to fail without fear. Courses are uh, NGSS grade band, Align, Common Core Align, as well with uh, math and ELA, and they're designed to really foster 21st century skills. So we're talking about courses that allow our students to dig in and really achieve the goals that you're looking for in your classes. Um, that's something that we'll certainly talk a little bit more about later on. So we've got a couple of goals for today's webinar. Um, the first is that we want to define what we mean by drone programming. Um, this is something that's really, really interesting, this ability now to not just fly drones. Um, and flying drones is extremely fun. Um, but we want to take things a step further with our, with our students and give them the ability to integrate computer science into what they do in their courses. Um, we want to talk about actually programming their drones and creating autonomous flying machines and what that can look like um, in diverse learning scenarios. Um, but then we want to talk about what are our equipment options? What can we use um, to extend our drone education with our students? Uh, and once again, this is regardless of their experience. Um, we don't have to feel that our, our students need to be experts. We ourselves don't need to be experts either. Um, what are the things that we can do to really start learning about drones, even if we don't physically have one? Um, we'll dig right into that. And uh, I should put a note right here that I am an excitable kind of guy. Um, when I'm excitable, that means I can speed up and speak quickly. So if you need me to slow down, don't hesitate to put that in the chat as well. Um, but I'm just really, really excited to jump into this topic today with you all. So with that being said, we can jump right in by first and foremost, um, understanding the coding environment. Um, what do we expect to encounter with our students? What do we expect for them to see? What do we expect for them to understand? And what do we need to understand to really effectively engage drone coding, actually flying a drone using computer code? Well, the first thing that we should consider is actually what a drone is. Um, it's useful to form a definition for a couple of reasons, but um, the big reason is that we want to change our students' mindsets. We want to change their paradigms around what a drone is used for, and that helps by establishing a definition. Um, for the vast majority of the students that you will work with, um, their first encounter with drones will be as a completely recreational device. Um, they will know it as a toy, first and foremost. Um, for adults of a certain age, um, many of us did not think about that word drone very, very often until right around 2001, when we were hearing more and more in the news about the drones being used for military applications. Um, so right away, you can see there's a generational divide when you think about what drones are and what they're used for. Um, when we're working with our students, we want to really um, establish this idea with our students that they're not working with toys, but they're working with tools. They're working with tools that are a great way to learn about physics and science. They're working with tools that are very, very complex and oftentimes extremely sensitive, um, but they're working with tools in such a way that means that we have to respect those tools and respect the way that we use them. Um, a really, really short and easy way to understand what a drone is, is to think of it fundamentally as a flying robot. Um, as an aside, if you want a really useful definition for robotics, um, a robot is a machine that does work aut autonomously. And we're talking about physical scientific work. It's moving itself or something else. So if we're thinking about a machine that moves itself or something else, um, it's moving a box or it's just going from point A to point B, um, a drone is that. It just happens to do that by, by flying. And generally speaking, when we think about drone technology, it's, it's doing this task, flying from point A to point B, um, using a variety of sensors. Um, sensors just being pieces of equipment attached to the drone 
that allow the drone to know something about the outside world uh, and its place in that outside world. Um, some of those pieces of equipment are really, really common. You can find them inside of your cell phone. Um, things like gyroscopes and accelerometers. So the drone knows how fast it's going in a direction and in what direction that it's going in. Um, but also things like GPS. Um, many drones include GPS so that they know where they are. But if you're getting some more specialized uses for drones, many drones carry cameras. Um, many drones carry infrared sensors. Many drones use things like heat sensors and humidity sensors, use things like thermometers. Um, there are drones that will have the ability to carry payloads, actually carry objects. Um, they can vary greatly. Um, but the basic idea is that this drone is going to use a combination of both human input and computer code to fly itself from one location to another. Um, so that means that if we can really create an experience that captures that, the fact that they're gonna be using computer code as well as human inputs to fly from one place from another, you've created this foundational experience and foundational definition that can apply to drones used in all kinds of applications. It's kind of like learning arithmetic. If you learn those basics of arithmetic first, you can expand into geometry. You can expand into trigonometry. You can expand into calculus. Um, you can expand into differential equations and any other foundation in mathematics doing some really exciting things that you want to expand into if you get the basics first. Now, the cool thing, one of the cool things that we do at Next Wave STEM is we are committed to equipment that allows us to establish those basics before we do anything else. Um, this is the first big takeaway I would encourage for anyone on our webinar today when they're considering studying drones for students in varying situations. Um, you wanna understand your technology platform and you wanna understand um, a platform that allows us to do many different things, but teaches the fundamentals really well, more than anything. Um, so us at Next Wave STEM, we're committed to the Tello EDU drone. Um, the Tello drone is manufactured by DJI. Um, they are the world leader in drone technology. So that means that you're gonna be getting something that flies really well. Um, and that's important. Making a distinction between toys that may not fly so well, they're very accessible for our students and then moving to a drone that is not inaccessible for our students, not inaccessible for your classroom, but flies like a professional grade drone is super important. Um, this is what we will call a quadcopter, meaning four propellers. Um, those propellers are three inches long. We've got built-in functionalities like uh, range finder and uh, barometer. Um, the drone connects to Wi-Fi. doesn't need to connect to our school Wi-Fi at all, but can connect to a device Wi-Fi. It has the ability to charge with rechargeable batteries, both via battery chargers and micro USB charging port. Um, this is the kind of technology and fidelity that our students need in order to understand this drone as a tool and not as a toy. And when we're flying drones, it's important to understand that once we have the correct tool, once we have the correct equipment, and we find ourselves in these in-class scenarios, um, we have to consider the ancillary um, dynamics of flying drone that make drone flying such a special situation and such a special experience for our students. Um, we have to think about things like the rules and laws regarding drone flight. Um, do you know that it is illegal to fly a drone above 400 feet in the United States of America? Uh, do you know that there is a federal program, um, the U.S. federal program from the FAA, CARP, called Part 107 that allows for students as young as 14 years old to get a license to operate a drone commercially. That's right, flying a drone to make money. Um, do we know our local and state regulations around drone flight? Those things are important. And because of the size and weight of this drone, um, none of them becomes a particular hindrance for what we wanna do in the classroom. So knowing what our regulations are, knowing what our rules are is important. Um, having an effective space for experimentation in drone flight. Um, you'll notice in this video, we're flying indoors in a relatively cramped um, room. We wanna make sure that whether we are 
at home or if we're working at hybrid or if we're back in person, we can actually operate this drone in our space. And it's important, once again, that if we don't have the physical drone at all, we still have lots of really good options. So not only do we need equipment that we know that works really well, but we need to make sure that we are considering those outside ancillary considerations. We do not want to get in over our head without understanding that this is something that will functionally work for us, which in our situation will work really, really well. So now that we have considered flying the drone manually, what we want to do is consider, hey, we can fly a drone manually, we can give this thing to a space, but how in the world do we make this work with our students who don't have access to the ground? Um, if we're not in an after school program, if we're not during school time in my STEM class or in my technology class, um, how does this become real for our students? What opportunities do they have? And that, my dear friends on our call today, is where we jump into this idea of actual drone flight simulation. Not only are we able to manually fly this drone connected to a smart device, but we're also able to autonomously code and program this drone to respond to just a single input. You were basically telling the drone to take off and you get the simulated flight. Um, but the cool thing about this experience is that we're just not able to simulate with block-based coding, but we're actually able to connect to physical drones and fly themselves. We see this autonomous flight become a process now. Our students have to learn computer science and apply that to a physical machine. And those processes, the physical um, computer science, uh, the physical machine, they don't have to live simultaneously together at the exact same time. That's a great experience that accessibility comes in being able to program a drone and see that drone fly virtually um, before we actually connect to our drone and fly our drone in real life, IRL. As some, as, as some of the very, very cool kids might say. We accomplished that here at Next Wave STEM using uh, drone blocks. Um, drone blocks has been an amazing technology partner. We've tried a couple of different ways to fly our drone using code, using computer science. And what we've learned is that drone blocks is the best way, bar none, to fly a tele drone using computer science, to have this really amazing introductory flight experience. So Desmond, this all sounds fine, great, and good. Um, you're talking about flying the drone manually, making sure we have the right drone. Um, you're talking about uh, flying the drone autonomously and virtually, having something that our students can work with so that they can practice flying the drone and then fly the drone IRL, actually see this thing up in the air. Um, what exactly would this experience look like? What could they do? I'm so, so glad you asked. Um, the first thing we want to consider is actually our physical spaces. Um, before we ever fly this drone, once again, we need to consider our, both our federal and state and local laws and regulations around drone flight. Um, a great example, another federal law, is that if we're Within five miles of an airport, we need to get special dispensation from that airport in the FAA, or um, we need to find an indoor location for our drones. Um, using open source material like Google Maps or Google Earth or even Apple Maps, whatever cartographical tool that you have, um, lets us know, one, how close we are to some of those sensitive areas. Um, if you're in the Washington DC area or near military, um, facilities. We may not be able to fly there or even flying over um, sports venues that are in use or hospital buildings or even your school, maybe sensitive areas that are prohibited from flying a drone. So that, that first thing, mapping out our flight area becomes really important. But also this tells us really, really useful information about distance. Um, for our students who might not have super duper strong um, cartographic skills, this is an excellent opportunity for them to start to learn more about those skills. So once we've actually planned our flight area, whether that's around our school or if we're at home, around our home, or if we're at a summer camp, um, working around our summer camp area, um, what we now have is this 
interesting opportunity to plan and explore a flight. Um, in this example, um, we have a park, very, very commonly named park here in the US, Washington Commons Park here in the Chicago land area. And this map, um, we see this park is pretty squarish. It's, a, it's an urban area. Um, things are lined out neatly on the grid for the most part, and, uh, and our park is framed up, for lack of better words, um, by some streets. So we're able to fly in the perimeter of this park in pretty much a rectangle. Um, the cool thing about using these tools and thinking about this drone is that we're planning movement through real world space virtually before we ever begin. And we can do this planning um, because of just of the normal features of a map. Um, maps have keys uh, and those keys tell us exactly uh, or give us a really good estimate at the very least um, how far features of that map are from each other. I can kind of estimate how far this drone will need to fly based on what I see on this map. I'm just tracing some lines out. So when we think about planning a flight like this, um, what we have this awesome opportunity to do is to now integrate ideas of computer science, but also I integrate ideas in mathematics. And that's what we want to take a look at now. Um, this idea that we want to create this flight path around this theoretical park, this, which is actually a real world park, um, someplace that's not too far from my home here in Chicago. And we will actually line this up. We'll, we'll design code that we can run inside of our simulation environment. So I'm going to actually jump over to drone blocks now. We want to take a look at what that looks like. Um, when our students are programming their drones, they want to find themselves and we want to place them in scenarios where drone flight becomes easy to visualize. So when we're using a tool like drone blocks, if you're working with students who are at home or in a hybrid learning scenario, what you've created is this amazing ability to actually get a preview of what their real world flight is going to actually do. Our, our drone blocks environment here in the second tab is actually a three-dimensional representation of what real flight looks like. Um, we can actually zoom right in on our drone here. And just with a little rotation, we can actually see um, this drone with a blue black. And on the left-hand side here, we've actually got representation, both um, mathematical representation in terms of distance, but also computer science representation with respect to the way the drone is going to fly. When our students are engaged in computer science, when they're um, learning how to code and give machines instructions, um, that's at its essence what coding is, is learning how to give machines instructions they can follow. Um, what's really useful at the very beginning is not putting them in a situation where they're so worried about getting every single solitary keystroke right, especially if we're giving complex instructions. Um, that's why we believe so much at Next Wave STEM in drag and drop block based coding. On our left hand side here, we'll notice a variety of menus that control um, the motion of the drone, things like having the drone take off in the air, fly forward, uh, y'all right 90 degrees. That's a technical aeronautical term for causing the drone to rotate. So we're also baking in um, real scientific terminology here as we work. Um, but we're also defining how far these things and how much these things should happen. Um, things like multiplying an integer by another integer to get a, a specific distance, or I could just put in that specific distance. Um, drone blocks allows us to dial in perfectly what we want to see our drone to do, as long as we understand how to describe our instructions in natural English language. So this is a really cool example of just trying to fly our drone in a basic rectangle. It uses uh, 10 instructions. And when we cause our drone to take off, we're actually going to see those instructions highlighted as the drone flies. So I'm going to click on this 
convenient hamburger menu and I'm going to click on the launch mission button and this drone is going to take off in the air and start flying. Uh, yes, you'll see the drone fly here on our computer and you'll actually hear a pretty good simulation of what that drone in flight sounds like. Uh, let's take a look and see exactly what's happening. So our drone has taken off and is in the air. We're going to zoom out so we can get a better look at what's going on. And as our drone is in the air, we're noticing just a slight tap snafu where our drone is stuck in space. Our drone, we've actually hit a little bit of snag here with our coding. That's okay though, because what we'll do is we'll make an adjustment here right on the fly. So I'm going to click on this reset button. And instead, we're going to remove some complexity from our code. Um, the great thing about scratch, drag, and drop coding is that we get to simulate our flights ahead of time. Instead of seeing an actual drone hanging in the air, and we're wasting battery, and we're dealing with the issue of, of whether or not our drone is going to operate or whether or not um, we're operating safely, um, we can actually test these things before our drone begins to fly, and we can make adjustments on the fly. Another great feature of drag and drop based coding is that you don't see me typing anything. Uh, this is really important for our students for whom this is their first experience with coding in computer science. Um, we're giving them the opportunity to make changes and understand processes and troubleshoot things. If the drone isn't flying, could we try something completely different? Could we actually switch things up and remove pieces of our code, for example, just throw them straight into the trash and try them again. We don't have to delete, we don't have to search, we don't have to worry uh, whether or not a comma is in the right place or if we're missing an open or a closed bracket. Just that quickly, a couple of seconds, we were able to make a modification to our code and actually try to run that code. Um, let's try that again, knowing that we've just had our first test. And let's try test number two. So our drone is in the air. And now that it's in the air, we've got motion as our drone is flying forward. As I mentioned before, we get things simulated even down to the noise that the drone is going to make while it's flying. But we're going to mute that noise as um, if you're like me, you fly these drones a lot, uh, that noise will get very, very familiar, maybe a little bit too familiar right away. As our drone is flying, as we're in the simulated world, flying at these great distances, right? Um, we are now able to visualize for our students and visualize for ourselves what's going to happen. And once again, this is all through drag and drop block based coding. Um, we are getting simple instructions to this drone on how it should fly. But these simple instructions are what our physical real world drone will actually do. You can see here, we're doing this strictly through the power of the internet. We're flying, in this case, a perfect square, um, a square that's 50 feet by 50 feet. Um, in this scenario, without ever getting our hand on a drone. Now, of course, we can fly things like squares all day long. But through the power of computer science, we can do things that can change how fast the drone is moving through space. Change our altitude up and down in order for our drone to land. Um, control our drone in all six axes. Have our drone flying diagonals. Have our drones flying particular curves. Um, using the power of math, once again, we can do things like have our drones fly even trigonometric functions or include things like, like uh, standard constants like pi or even theta. Um, for those of us who are just wigging out as math nerds, what we have is the power to really dig in and make this drone do whatever we want it to do and move however we want it to move. And we even get the added benefit in our case of even knowing how much battery we're going to drain when we use these drones to fly. Our drone is returned to its original start position and just landed after it's flown this perfect rectangle. So here we have the first part of this flight scenario where we're connecting um, this computer science experience as something that our students are able to do. Our students are able to drag and drop code 
portions and build custom code. Um, we can have our students even define and make their own variables and change those variables mid flight um, so that we can have even more responsive flights as they're executing their code. Um, the sky really is the limit when we think about understanding the basic ways in which drones should be moving and the way that they should respond to computer code. And then from there, build on top of those basics to really build expansive, complex code. Um, that's something that we build on. We engage those basic skills in our curricula, and we are really excited for the ways that your students will um, take computer coding, this app-based, drag-and-drop-based coding language, and apply that to an actual machine. So we have an example there of code that will allow our drones to fly around this actual environment, this real world environment. And we have this code kind of replicated here on this next flight. But the thing about flying a drone virtually versus flying a drone in person is that we have to understand that even flying in person means that we have to make considerations for what's in our physical space. Um, we're building in now ideas for ethics and ethically flying a drone. Um, do we understand whether or not we have permission from our local municipality to fly our drone? Um, do we understand why we want to fly our drone in this particular pattern? Will we be simulating something like a delivery? Um, more and more we're seeing companies focus specifically on parcel and package delivery using autonomous aeronautic technology. Are we doing things like videography? Um, is the next filmmaker who's going to make the next amazing blockbuster franchise bringing people back to the theaters going to cut their teeth flying drones and using your drone camera? Um, do we need to have situations where we're even studying public safety and public health applications? Things like flying drones in emergency situations, responding to fires or responding to floods. Um, it rained a massive amount here in the Midwest this past weekend. And in many places, um, we know that people are suffering flood damage, both in urban environments and rural environments. Um, we're seeing insurance companies and federal response um, personnel using drone technologies to help survey and search for damage in those situations. Um, what can we actually simulate and build facsimiles of and actually expand upon those applications our, our students are learning? Um, those opportunities really, really are limitless. So what becomes really useful then is considering a, a distance learning instructional model. Um, we know the ways in which we might be able to use this drone in person, actually physically using this drone and coding the drone. Um, but if we're flying, our drone, and we're using a hybrid, or we're hybrid plane to come back in person. If we know we're going to be in person, um, what are those situations that we know are going to work really well for us with respect to lesson design and operation of our drone? And next wave STEM, we believe in the 5E instructional model. Um, it's important for our students to really first um, be hooked in. They have to have their own reason why they have to really want to engage in the technology. And drones are an amazing way to do that. Um, once again, many of our students will understand drone technology from the concept of really being recreational. Flying drones is fun, point blank period. Once you get your hands on a drone and you fly it yourself, you're going to want to fly it all the time. You're going to constantly be charging the batteries. And just that in and of itself, before we talk about the kind of jobs, before we talk about the industries in which drones become associated, um, we want to understand that it's just fun to do. And that prospect of having a drone in the air and then applying that to ways that we facilitate work or actually solving problems, um, then that's where really the light bulb moments and aha moments are found. When we consider exploring, we know that we're going to be educating um, in both hard sciences, physical sciences, thinking about physics and reactions of forces, things that are covered really extensively when we consider NGSS um, standards. Um, but we're also going to be teaching computer science, um, CSTA and ISD standards being covered as we consider these concepts um, that students may have never seen before. Our students will have to really dig in and understand those cause and effect, effect relationships. 
Um, do we understand even how the initial orientation of our drone will affect the final flight, especially on a drone like Artello that does not have a GPS, knowing that we can't just hit a button, have our drone return to us simply, um, actually engaging those ideas of being a pilot in command of your drone in this flight scenario. Um, and once our students are able to build those cause and effect relationships, they have this opportunity now to elaborate, um, to actually show their learning, to code and build their code, to fly their drones, to troubleshoot those drone experiences. And after all that good work, you have the chance to really get that feedback. Do our understand, students understand what's happening as we're flying our drone? And can they even um, expand further, regardless of whether they're in kindergarten or in fourth grade or seventh grade, or if they're a senior in high school, can they expand further and build new solutions and build new performance tasks that really shows that they kind of get what we're giving them? Um, when we think about an instructional model, what we've got now is really this opportunity to work together in groups and in teams as well. Um, something that is difficult, particularly in the distance learning and hybrid learning methodologies is understanding ways in which we foster intentional student collaboration. Um, one thing that I do know for many of us as educators is that we've become really, really, really good at using our digital tools. And that's going to be the name of the game. We're introducing a new physical tool that has a digital tool component. When we think about the computer science and coding, the tools like like Zoom or Google Workspaces now, Google for Education was what it was called before. Um, even if we're a Microsoft 365 school and we're using responsive office documents, even responsive uh, spreadsheets and slides uh, become a really, really powerful way. Um, engineering, that word engineering itself um, has is based in a Latin word for being clever. So clever use of technology allows us to really facilitate that group work, um, whether that is in groups when we think about our students as peer-to-peer -peer groups, or with you as an instructor and your instructional staff when we're in that place giving um, the explore, the actual exposition moments, or when we're doing the evaluation moments for our students. So a great place when we think about our actual instructional model and what we want to present to our students and ways to get them engaged is to think about real world problems. Um, everything that we do in X-Wave STEM is geared to preparing our students to be thinking intentionally about real world scenarios that they'll be dealing with uh, and that many of us are dealing with even now. During the course of the pandemic, we've seen students engaged in citizen science, but in citizen engineering in some ways that we might have never considered previously. Um, there's been for a couple of years now this really amazing thought process and a groundswell of citizen scientists and student scientists, um, people who are engaged in making observations around the natural world um, and feeding into the work of professionals doing science getting that huge bulk of data and information for us to analyze and really understand things we did not know about our physical, natural world. Um, but during the last 15 months, we've seen this groundswell of citizen engineering, um, amateurs who have access to technologies, um, and those technologies could be simple as actual web simulation to solve real human problems. Um, that becomes the real difference, the big differentiator between science and engineering is the ability to solve real world problems. And we've seen those real world problems getting solved, yes, using drones. Um, we've heard those stories about manufacturing and 3D printing um, with great abundance, but even drones as well. During the course of the pandemic, we've seen essential items like medicine, like food, um, being delivered to our populations that could not make those deliveries, populations that were physically distanced. Um, this has really decreased thanks to other scientific breakthroughs like vaccination, um, but we're still seeing drones being used for those situations of remote delivery. Um, things in places, going to places where human beings could not get easily, um, drones are becoming more and more essential to getting that work done. But we're also thinking about drones as assistive protective devices. 
um, for our populations, once again, that have really tough times moving out, who are dealing with longer term effects of this pandemic, um, the drone becomes a way to move through three dimensional space. Um, and that is a huge, huge game changer. But we can expand even further. Um, high, or I should say colony collapse syndrome. Um, some of us may have heard this word and there are many other things we've been concerned about since the time this originally became a part of our scientific lexicon. Um, many of us, when we think about insects are thinking about um, cicadas and murder hornets right now. And thankfully the mur murder hornet um, problem was grossly overstated. Um, but as our world continues to change, we have these persistent challenges um, regardless of whether or not we're really paying attention to them or they're top of mind. Um, we still have a pollination problem and we're seeing drones being deployed to even solve some of those problems, acting as artificial pollinators in some situations. Once our students understand what's going on in the world around them, they have a hook into why they would want to learn about drones and how drones can be used, not only to change their lives, but the lives of others. It's from that point, really digging in and exploring this with our students, whether we're in person or hybrid. Um, things like our whiteboard options like Zoom um, or Markup, or we mentioned before, um, ChemDraw or LawText, if we're working in specific scientific applications, allow our students to collaborate as they're brainstorming and even as they're coding to solve some of these problems. And really not so much problems as much as they are challenges. Our students are able to express themselves not only through the physical flight of the drone. Um, yes, expression in doing things like showing their understanding of angle sense or cardinality, or showing their ability to navigate a three-dimensional Cartesian plane because our drone does fly in three dimensions. Um, that becomes really, really critical, but demonstrating a much more robust understanding of those cause and effect relationships. Um, actually showing what they know in a recordable, way. Our digital collaboration tools are great for that. I'm looking forward for the times where our students are recording using their iPads or using their smart devices to actually record their drones in flight and record data about precision and accuracy of their, of their flights and troubleshooting, taking in information um, about the actual equipment, the state of the propellers, um, and uploading that all that into your class drive. So you've got a running technical log of what's happening as you're flying drones. Your tools are already there. You just have to be clever in how you use them. And then we think about those elaborative moments um, where we're able to give our students the ability to share what they know, but also to evaluate that. Your LMS tool is gonna be key. You guys at this point, our LMS masters. And if you haven't mastered your LMS, so you don't know what a learning management system even is quite yet, um, continue to develop, to develop your professional skills. Um, Moodle is your friend. Blackboard is your friend. Google Classroom or Google for Education, those are your friends. Um, they will empower you with exactly what you need in order to build a robust physical and digital class space. Spaces that will work for our students who are both hybrid and remote and then who will be back in person. Because those skill sets, those skill sets in digital work and even digital citizen, citizenship um, that your students acquired over the last 15 months, they're not going away. They're going to fundamentally change how we approach what we do as we teach STEM in the future. And being prepared for that change is going to be critical. So I know I just hit you with a fire hose of information and hopefully the information is going to be useful as we consider um, what we are going to be doing with our students in the fall um, in the rest of the summer, both in school time and out of school time. Um, the question now becomes, what can we at Next Wave STEM do to help you? Well, I return to this idea of our actual coursework. Um, many of the performance tasks that you've seen today and the actual software that you've seen are what we're using in our drones courses. We're flexible. Um, those courses are once again designed to standards on NGSS, grade bands, 
as well as Common Core Math and ELA. Um, we're fostering those 21st century skills, skills that have been identified specifically for our students as being critical to being employable in future um, applications and future work. We want to make sure that our students are ready and we want to build them up with quality curriculum content that allows for that. K through 12 and three technology bands. In our K through two level, um, we have courses in robotics and drones. Our students have this opportunity to explore physical objects in this really mind blowing, um, really eye opening way. Um, some of them may think that they're just playing with toys, but they're actually learning about the world around them using hands on technology. For our three through five students, we expand into our three technology bands. Not only will they build and code robots, but they'll fly and fly autonomously these drones as they discover uh, unmanned aviation. And on top of that, they'll learn more about 3D printing and product design, where we'll actually be closing an engineering loop, a design loop, um, so that we get the sense of what it actually takes to make so many of the objects that we use in our everyday world. In our six to eight courses, we expand upon those ideas, um, coding the robot, coding that inbound for a purpose, solving problems, um, exploring drone coding with Tello. We're gonna be focused more on human application and human impact. And then the idea of even three-dimensional di three development, not just 3D printing, but what it means to design in 3D and be clever in that design. And then in our nine through 12 courses, we're actually evaluating um, the costs and trade-offs and benefits for real world applications and scenarios. We want to actually apply what we've learned and what we know to these situations. We're growing taxonomically in a way that's predictable in a way that makes sense and empowers your students no matter where they're at in their experience. And once again, these are really designed so that if your students haven't had a whole lot of opportunity with this emerging technology previously, they can step in and pick up and really be enriched. And this is also designed for you as an instructor, that if you've never had experience with this emerging technology, um, this becomes a great place for you to start to build out your STEM program. Now, what we also want to do in Next STEM is to make sure that your solution is turnkey ready to go. Um, that means that in addition to the actual course licenses and equipment kits, um, making sure that you have all that you're, that you're going to need, um, we're offering professional development and support. Um, that means that you'll know how to use our equipment and know how to run these courses with fidelity, that you'll be extremely confident when you run in our implementing with your students, that you're gonna see some really, really effective solutions. And we're able to customize. We can vary your equipment kits, we can vary your professional development based on what you need. We wanna make sure that you, as you're working with Next Wave STEM, get to exactly where you wanna go. Now, I know I've said a lot about what we can do, but at Next Wave STEM, we also have a group of amazing instructors who are able to teach for you. If you are in the Chicagoland area, we can send an instructor for your during school or out of school time course to run your courses um, with your equipment. Or if you're out of state, if you're in one of our emerging markets, um, we're also able to conduct our courses virtually. Um, we can use your equipment, but teach virtually. Our instructors have been teaching virtually throughout the entire course of the pandemic. And we want to make sure that you have the highest expertise that you can bring to bear in your classroom as your students explore this emerging technology as they're continuing to grow. So I want to pause for a couple of seconds. Um, you may have some questions about the drones, about drone flights or just regulation around drones, or even some more things uh, that you want to ask about next wave STEM. I want to pause for a moment. Um, once again, we can't open our mics or unmute ourselves, but the chat is there and so is the q and um, I'm going to let those fingers fly across those keyboards for any questions that you might have. And there's no such thing as a bad question, and I love questions.
while it is pretty quiet still here on our chat, which is just fine. I know that some of us may have just had our minds blown by all these amazing opportunities that we might dig into when we think about flying our drones and coding our drones um, autonomously, giving these really, really cool experiential opportunities for our students. Oh, we just had something pop up on the Q&A. Awesome. Ooh, what is the cost of drone blocks? Is it per student or a one-time fee? Doreen, it is a one-time fee. Um, it's not a per student license at all. That means that your students will have access to that software. Um, they can access that either at your school or remotely. They can do pretty much whatever you need to do to make that program work for you all. Um, we'd be happy to connect you with a school partnership uh, manager to get you some more information around pricing, but we're not gonna like nickel and dime and chop you up on a student by student basis. Um, once again, the goal is to make sure that we can get that technology in as many hands as we can. Really good question there. For our participants who uh, might watch the recording of this call, or those of us who are still working up um, and thinking through more questions, um, I do want to leave you with my information. We did, however, just get another question here. Um, how difficult is this to set up? Not difficult at all. Um, your students will have access to the app. So there's the app that goes with the actual smart device. Um, they won't need to input any kind of student information. That's going to be something that you're going to have access to, that anyone can have access to. Um, the same thing is on the website as well. So we're going to give you the website that you'll go to log into um, and your potential or your particular login credential for the website. Um, you don't have to have any worries about um, actual SOPA or COPA because we're not collecting any student data whatsoever. Um, the only thing that you'll need to consider is how this will integrate into your own LMS. Um, we have an LMS system here in XA system that we work that uh, we're really, really proud of, but we can also adjust the content to live in your LMS as well. So if you're concerned saying, hey, we've got lots of student data that we have to manage around this, no worries. We're not collecting any student data. All that information will remain with you. Another great question there. Um, I did want to leave um, before we end our webinar today, just a little bit more time for questions. But as we're asking these questions, um, I also want to leave contact information for here at Next Wave STEM as well. Um, once again, I'm the Chief Learning Officer. Uh, my email is really easy, desmond at nextwavestem.com. And you can also find us on all uh, social media or major social media networks. I won't say all social media networks, but all major social media networks at the at Next Wave STEM handle. Um, we are on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Facebook. Uh, we are not on TikTok. I neither tick nor do I talk. I've been telling that joke for a while because it's still true, um, but we do have an intern, so we might have an Next Wave STEM TikTok coming at some point. And this is really good to know um, that there are concerns about student logins. Um, yeah, that's a concern that we consider. We don't need individual emails. We want to make this easy for you. And we want to have access. So just know that using a tool where you're coding for drones, using the Tello EDU, using the drone box software really lowers that barrier to access for you as an instructor and for your students as well. And the very, very last thing, our penultimate slide for today, uh, is a reminder for our webinar next week. Uh, next week, we are going to be right back into the swing of things after the holiday weekend with bouncing back with learning games, um, exploring the importance of hands-on learning both inside and outside of the classroom. Um, that's at the same bat time, same bat channel. That will be Tuesday, July 6th at 4 o'clock. Um, PM Central Daylight Time. Um, check us out at nextwavestem.com, uh, stem-training-professional-development. Um, if you go to the Next Wave STEM website or just type in Next Wave STEM Professional Development, you'll find that link to be able to reserve your spot right there. 
for all of us who were able to come on out. Thank you so much. Um, we're hopeful that you're having a wonderful summer season. Um, we're hopeful that you're getting rest and recharged and refueled as we get ready to move back into this fall. And we're hopeful that you continue to stay safe and well. Um, be on the lookout as, with a follow-up email from today's webinar with this slide deck, the recording, and your uh, certificate of attendance. Um, everyone, thank you so, so much. And we'll talk to you next Tuesday. Bye-bye now.